Donc maintenant, je vais rentrer dans, dans, la, dans cette soirée qui s'appelle Observation entre satellite, observatoire, gravité et qui, de toute évidence, est une rencontre qui est liée à l'espace et à la pratique artistique avec l'espace. Avec d'un côté le regard vers le haut, l'observation des étoiles, qui est une de nos pratiques immémoriales. Euh, je pense que dès que les êtres humains se sont levés sur la patte de derrière, ils ont regardé vers le ciel, ils ont essayé de comprendre. D'autre part, ce regard réflexif, hein, avec les satellites en orbite et la présence humaine en orbite basse, donc on s'est regardé comme dans un miroir. Et observation, parce qu'observation, c'est euh, en tant que base, en quelque sorte, et fondement de la science, hein, qu'elle soit cette science positiviste, qui repose aussi, je vais revenir sur l'expérimentation, mais, mais également la science vernaculaire, la science mythique, qui repose aussi sur l'observation euh, et qui produit une explication, que cette explication soit fondée ou pas. En tout cas, c'est par l'observation qu'on produit, euh, qu produit du sens. Et l'expérimentation, qui est le, le deuxième pilier euh, de, de, du domaine scientifique, et peut-être aussi du domaine artistique, une expérience qui se joue et qui se rejoue avec euh, aujourd'hui, enfin de tout temps, mais aujourd'hui en particulier, le rôle des instruments. Et un des points moi, qui m'intéresse, c'est que nous construisons, nous nous posons des questions et nous construisons des instruments pour répondre à ces questions. Mais la façon dont on va construire les instruments induit la, la réponse. Enfin, en tout cas, conditionne, sinon on n'induit pas la réponse. Et c'est quelque chose qu'on verra euh, clairement, je pense, avec euh, l'expérience le, de de Galilée d'un côté, mais également avec les satellites aussi, avec, euh, avec Marcus. Donc maintenant, je voudrais inviter Marcus Neustetter à, à me rejoindre. Oh, ok, I need to speak in English. Euh, la présentation de Marcus sera en anglais. Euh, si vous avez des difficultés à un moment ou à un autre pour comprendre, dites-le nous, on vous fera des synthèses, mais a priori, on ne traduit pas. So marking, Marcus Neustetter, as his talk is Seeking Dialogue and Unfolding Meaning. I'm going to, to introduce you in French, if you don't mind. Okay. So um, Marcus est né à, à Johannesburg. Il est uh, sud-africain et autrichien, les deux à la fois. Il a une maîtrise en art de l'université with Westerland, right? Okay. <laughs> Euh, son œuvre se situe à l'intersection de l'art, de la science et de l'activisme, activisme dans le sens d'un engagement, également aussi avec la, la technologie. C'est un artiste que je qualifie de plurimédia, où la forme est une réponse au concept et au contexte et n'est pas euh, prédéterminée. Un point également important, c'est qu'il a une pratique euh, curatoriale, une pratique euh, d'organisateur et de, de producteurs, et donc qui soutient le travail de nombreux autres artistes, et notamment ou principalement avec le studio euh, à Johannesburg qui s'appelle The Trinity Session, et entre autres choses qu'il a organisé, parce que là ça vous dira pour vous, qui, puisque nous allons accueillir ISEA l'an prochain à Paris, Marcus a été un des organisateurs d'ISEA en 2018 à Durban. Voilà, donc je lui laisse la, la parole. I'm just going to say thank you very much for having me here. Um, to obviously Leonardo Olatz, uh, the laser event, the organizers, the team, you. It's, been, it's fantastic to be here and um, to share my story. I'm also looking forward to your presentation afterwards. I'm very keen to hear what it's all about. Um, so to start off, my talk today is called Seeking Dialogue and Unfolding Meaning. You'll see outside, um, as you came in, there are some drawings that are presented. I'll show some pictures later on of where they come from. Uh, but those are part of the process of unfolding and drawing and seeking meaning. Um, and as an artist, I've always been fascinated with this idea of um, not necessarily producing by myself, but collaborating, engaging, connecting, and working across disciplines. Uh, what is very important to note that coming out of Johannesburg in South Africa, there
there is a, a need to engage and connect with others. Our art industry is not the same as it is in other parts of Europe that has got queues standing to get into museums. Um, it's, some, it's something that's very particular in the way in that we need to engage with new audiences and build new opportunities for ourselves as artists and collaborators that we're working with. And so from an early, early age, I was very interested in crossover practice and especially in the field of art and technology and science because I felt that the conversation with the scientists were giving me a new perspective, not only on my discipline, but onto the communities that I wanted to engage with and talk to. And so today I'm going to take you through two projects that I'm fusing together into one concept um, that is really about me working with scientific objects or instruments in order to create meaning for myself. And uh, these instruments are both instruments that help me look up into the sky and down onto Earth. So I've been amazed and fascinated by this timeline that we're on that's looking back in time in both directions with archaeologists down into Earth and with astronomers into the sky. And so this, this double perspective has, um, has got me fixated on spaces and instruments that can help me look that far. So one of the projects I'd like to introduce is called Sutherland Reflections. It's an eight-year project that started in 2009 with my collaborator Bronwyn Lace. And it was an artistic initiative that we did where as artists we wanted to engage with that observatory that's over there, this space. So talking to scientists and, and archaeologists and astronomers, etc., um, I eventually got introduced to a gentleman called Kevin Govender, who was responsible for the social development projects around the observatory. And he invited me to come and do a project at the observatory. So Bronwyn and I went and we thought, let's make a holiday and let's do a project there and engage somehow, but we quickly noticed that we're sitting in a place where there's a difference between the scientific development and community development. The community development still felt like we were sitting in the midst of apartheid. It still felt like we were sitting in the past. It still felt like we were dealing with um, huge segregation issues. And millions were being invested into the observatory. And so when we were being asked to do something at the observatory, we actually said, much more interestingly for us, we'd like to create a connection between the community and the scientific pursuit. And so what you have here are a series of images that show you what we did on the first day of the International Year of Astronomy. We decided to fly a kite. And the kite was just to get people to look up, to get the community who wasn't part of the observatory to think about looking up. That's all. Not worry about the stars, don't worry about anything else, just look up. And so you can see the wonderful kite experiences that we had. And slowly but surely, over eight years, we got the community to not only look up, and the scientists to look down, because they're up on a hill. Um, but we actually got to create an interconnection between um, what is above and what is on the ground. And I don't need to tell you that poverty on the ground is extreme in certain contexts uh, that even within our European neighbors, um, but uh, definitely in the global south. And what we noticed very quickly is that, that poverty is not just a financial poverty, but it's a poverty of aspiration, of dreaming, of journeying, of positioning yourself within a larger context and believing that it's possible for you to reach new heights. And so in this very dry, desolate, quiet place of the Karoo, we started to, for eight years, create interventions that looked at science from a very different point of view. We weren't trying to teach science. We weren't trying to um, explain what the science does. We were more trying to see how these instruments of scientific pursuit can help us dream. And so we started to create projects where we took people onto the plateau at the observatory to actually look at the stars in a completely new way. Not to explain what the stars mean, but rather to say that their voices had a place to resonate internationally and in the sky. And so um, I could talk for hours on this project, so I won't. <laughs> but you can see by the images that there's engagement that was very much about an experimentation, a research, a space for collaboration between other artists and scientists, uh, from archaeologists and, and, and paleontologists to astronomers and um, even some science fiction writers joined us. And the whole journey was really about making sense of concepts and creating collective drawings. And the most important part, program and part of this whole uh, dialogue was to understand that the stories that people had about the stars were actually stories about their own existence. And so very shortly after we started to rise the kites, about a year and a half later, the elders in the community started to trust us and started to come to us with their stories of forced removal. They told us about how they were forced off their land um, already in kind of, uh, uh, kind of during the apartheid times, already earlier than that, the Khoisan Bushmen were being chased and hunted in certain ways. You know, there was a very strong uh, history of, of displacement. And um, 
the elders of the community came and they could even still remember some of the old houses that they had. And they showed us these houses that were now rubble. And they explained the stories of how their land was taken from them and how they didn't know how to replace that land and how to tell these stories. And what happened was an intergenerational exchange between the youth, the children of the neighborhood that didn't understand this history and the elder people. And so what you see here, for example, is a session where we invited the elders to tell us where the houses used to be before they were forcibly removed from their land. And the children using ribbon to draw in the ground where the houses used to be to reenact that. And as you can imagine, these drawings became constellations. They became reflections of what's in the stars, and started to, we started to connect the narratives in the skies to the narratives on the ground. And so this generational leap was quite an important one because the younger community didn't believe that the observatory belonged to them. They thought this observatory, the scientific space up there, is not a place that they can go. And so what we did is we took the elders of the neighborhood, uh, we took the, the people from the old age home mainly that were telling the stories of the past, and we went to the observatory, which had, I think that is the Monet telescope, that's the German one. Uh, further down there's an American telescope, there's a Japanese telescope. I mean, the whole world is represented on that plateau. Um, but Sutherland, this little town at the foot of this observatory, was not represented. So we took everyone onto the hill and said, you were all forced from your land, um, conceptually at least, even if they didn't feel physically anymore they were forced, but they had no uh, um, connection to their land. And we said, you want to go back onto the plateau to see the stars, but you don't feel you're welcome. Let's create our own observatory. Let's create our own space. So this is one of many projects where we started to talk about ownership and who does observing the stars belong to. How does this major telescope that stands on this hill actually allow us to dream in our own way? So we went and we drew a big circle in the ground and you can see us all standing there holding up the walking sticks and saying, this is, this is the future Sutherland Observatory. This is our future space. This area here is where we want to build our own dome. And so several years later, with much um, engagement with the uh, scientists and, and challenging the, the questions around scientific research versus community development and uh, using the arts supports to do this. We built a corbel uh, structure that's a locally, local building style structure with a geodesic dome on top, which is a naked eye telescope that you can lie inside and you can look through the grid and see the stars at night. But most importantly what it is, it's a space to dream. It's a space for anyone that lives in that area to go to and say, I have access to that land because I want to go and look at the stars at night through my telescope. And that's something that we take for granted. We believe that these resources are there for us all the time. But this engagement with this very large um, uh, observatory and, and telescope, which is SALT, the Southern African largest telescope, which is over there, which is, costs huge investment money, has a lot of scientists going to, etc., was juxtaposed by this community dome, which was just the bare bones of a structure that helped us create a vision and a dream. And so with that in mind, this, this notion of creating dreams and connecting to communities has been very important for me as an artist to understand not necessarily the exchange of science and art in terms of exchange of knowledge, but what these things can do for us in, in, in aspiring. And I need to say that while we are currently building the, um, the large array of uh, radio telescopes in the Southern Hemisphere, uh, my question has always been what happens in the shadow of these telescopes? Now that we have the finances to build these things, what actually happens to the communities and the stories that we are on the ground versus the ones that are happening in space? And so for me, that is an ongoing pursuit and an ongoing story. So part of that ongoing story is that looking down part. So now we're looking up, now we're looking down. And on the looking down, I fell in love with this satellite. In 2009, uh, South Africa launched its first major observation satellite, and it's been floating through space, sending photographs to Earth. It's been very important because looking down at Earth from our own camera means we own the image. It's not Google that's sending us pictures. It's our own satellite, so it means that perspective is now ours, that image is ours. And I was very fortunate to get access to the server that was hosting all the photographs, and I got these photographs, and I turned them into all kinds of very colorful drawings and artworks for about a year and a half. Um, and here are some of them that are kind of abstract digital drawings that have evolved out of it. And these uh, digital works more and more became about um, simplifying what I saw below. And then suddenly um, there was a sun flare that uh, burnt up the technology on the, I mean, the computers on the satellite. And the solar storm basically meant that I could no longer get photographs. So suddenly my connection to the satellite was lost. 
she was no longer talking to me. I could no longer reach out and, and get the images. So I started to make disrupted images where I took the ones that I had and started to destroy them and disrupt them and created new types of images. I built monuments to this telescope saying, where is she? Where is she gone? Let's build a new rocket. So here you see, for example, a building that, I've, that I did the facade on where I take one of the drawings from this telescope image and I paint it onto the facade of the building as a monument, as an, a tribute to her. I started to create installations and performances that are all about telling the story and connecting to, through films and performances, etc., trying to connect to her. There's me on a stepladder shouting into the sky, asking Sumbandila to come back. So the satellite's name is Sumbandila, and Sumbandila in Venda, which is the uh, in South African language, means lead the way. And so symbolically, that was very important that in, in 2009, someone set a telescope to, or a satellite to lead the way for us. And now being, it being lost, how do we try and get it back? And so I started to get obsessed with doing things. I got commissioned by the South African Post Office to do postage stamps because I worked so much with scientists. They thought I'd be the right person to translate their ideas. And so sneakily into the center of it, I put Sumbandila, the satellite, just to say she too needs a postage stamp as a commemoration that she's out there, even though she was space junk, actually. And so this searching for this piece of space junk became an absolute dream of mine. And it went, it became completely, I became completely obsessed, and I still am. And trying to do things that, that were, I thought were never possible. So creating planetarium shows, searching for her with community members, building installations, building my own rockets, um, exploring performances around the world, looking for Sumbandila, and trying to get her to communicate back with me. So my discussions with researchers and scientists and philosophers have been really deep and meaningful for me as an artist to grow. And my relationship with this piece of technology that's supposed to give us vision changed radically, suddenly. The Moon Gallery has off offered to send my letter to Simondila to the moon in 2025. And currently this wonderful letter that I wrote um, for Sumbandila, which is an aerial view of what I think Sumbandila is seeing. So it's my view of what I think she's seeing on Earth. It's a little drawing. It's only about that size. It's a tiny little work. Um, has got a Morse code written on it as well that says, lead the way again. It's my call for hope, it's my call for aspiration, especially with what's going on on Earth. I believe we need this moment of hope and aspiration. And so here we see it, uh, this is the Moon Gallery, and floating in the Moon Gallery, one of those little blocks has got my letter to Sumbandila. So I'm hoping that one day the ISS, the International Space Station, where it's currently floating, um, will pass the, the satellite, and maybe the astronauts will go and open my letter and Morse code sing it to the, <laughs> to, to the satellite and try and create that connection back to this object to show us where to go. And I was so excited about this. I organized a whole exhibition looking back at 10 years of collaboration with the satellite. And here you see moments from this exhibition that happened late last year. Um, drawings, installations, performances, um, here, prototypes of what went to space, um, and a whole range of different kind of um, moments uh, that I've took out from the archive and brought to life again as a series of works in this, in this exhibition. And so I was very proud with other collaborators doing performances around Sumbadila, shouting, calling, and wanting her to connect to me. And even recently for the launch party in Amsterdam, I did a series of drawings, which you see some of them outside, that were live connections trying to respond to videos that I made about Sumbadila and drawing and having fun. And so I thought today could have been a tribute to my relationship with Sumandila, and I wanted to connect to her live, and something happened. 20, uh, 48 hours ago, I discovered that Sumandila is no longer around. Usually I can track her, there's a piece of software that you can use to track her. And I even sent a letter hoping, looking at how the ISS might intersect one day with this course that Sumandila is taking. And unfortunately, I've been so busy looking at the ground trying to figure out what's happening on the ground, I forgot to look up. And I forgot to connect to the satellite and actually look at her regularly. Because I was so busy drawing and focusing on what's happening here that I came across this news. And this was on 13th of December already. I completely missed that. That South African Sumadila satellite has finally back and fallen back into the atmosphere. Almost certainly it burnt up in the atmosphere as it returned. It's a shocker. <laughs> I must tell you, I'm extremely emotional. So my, my whole interface with trying to deal with Sumadila, it just tells me Sumadila is no longer on orbit. And there's something that happened to me in this moment of hope and aspiration that I thought, you know, given wars, given COVID, given everything that's going on, I moved to Vienna from Johannesburg, and there was this constant barometer, this constant 
buzzing in the sky, which is what these technological projects do to us. They make us dream and, and aspire, and suddenly that's been taken from me. And I'm lost right now, I must be very honest with you. <laughs> so I'll leave you with that, uh, because I think that's the most meaningful thing I can say, is that without the extension of this piece of technology and science that has given me all this hope and aspiration, I'm not sure what's coming next. So with that, I leave unfinished drawings outside and an open-ended presentation to you. So I hope that uh, this was a tribute to Sumbandila and her burning up in the atmosphere. So thank you for letting me do this. Thank you, Marcos. You stay here. Uh, I'll try to move around <coughs> and not cough into the microphone. Um, I mean, thank you. Um, I've known Marcus for a long, long time, and uh, I'm as, as emotional as you you are. Um, so, any any questions? Uh, en français, peut-être? Uh, des questions, des remarques, une réaction par rapport au projet de que Marcus vous a présenté? Est-ce que vous voulez aussi des explications complémentaires? Euh, alors, qui c'est qui passe le micro euh, yeah. alors, Manuela, d'abord. Wonderful, beautiful, poetic and inclusive work. I would like to know um, if uh, the, the astronomers and astrophysicists knew about your project and what you were doing with the, uh, the people living there or close to there. And if they did, what were their reaction? Thank you. Do you want to translate the question? Uh, no, I'm answering in English, so it makes no difference. <laughs> um, um, yes. So first of all, the the it was because of an invitation of the astro one of the one particular astrophysicist that I actually started this this engagement. So it was the, that was the starting point, and there was a constant conversation that was happening. Very often that conversation was more about what the science was that was happening in the skies, because I'm interested, I'm not, it's, you know, I was genuinely interested in what the science was. And over the years, as we did more and more projects, there was a recognition that what we were doing was meaningful and worth it. But uh, remember, the, on these observatories, the, the scientists work during night and sleep during the day, mainly. I mean, they've spent years ap applying to be in this large telescope, and then they get a chance. They're not going to worry too much about the artist who's saying to them, come and fly kites. So, um, so the conversations were very often in that in-between time when we both had a chance to reflect on what it means to be a scientist and what it means to be an artist. And the most meaningful moments were um, when, when we invited artists and scientists to stay with us. We had a farmhouse that the observatory actually sponsored to say, you know, this is where you can stay. And there was no internet, there was no cell phone um, connection. And so we were literally stranded in this place that was disconnected from anywhere. Uh, 40 kilometers away was the closest next house. And so we ended up having scientists and artists living with us in that house as it was a big uh, space. And in those moments, the truth about the projects came out. The aspiration that these scientists had around the kind of practice that they were doing and what it is that they wanted to achieve and what we wanted to achieve were very similar, just that we didn't reveal it in our methodologies and our process. And for me, that was meaningful because it meant that we were connecting on a very different level. We weren't trying to force each other to understand the disciplines. Sorry. We, we weren't trying to force each other to understand the disciplines, and that was important. Later on, um, when we tried to build the dome, the, 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 the community dome, um, I know that some scientists thought it was messing with the research. So I got some very nasty responses by some people that thought, no, no, this is not good because it, it brings people onto the plateau where we are supposed to study uh, the stars and we need absolute silence and darkness. And on the other hand, there were others that were fully supportive of it. Um, but it's a very difficult thing when when your pursuit is about keeping a place silent and dark in order to do your research. But if you know historically what silence and darkness means to many people in a, in a country where rape statistics are very high, where alcohol abuse is very high, where um, s a crime is very high, silence and darkness is uh, not a place to hide away in. It's sometimes a place of danger. And so we had to actually work with the community members to understand that silence and darkness is something we can celebrate. And that was a very important thing also for the scientists to acknowledge that what they're pursuing and the conditions that they need weren't necessarily the same. And those conversations were fascinating um, and, and very meaningful. Yeah. Um, uh, 
Thank you, Marcus. It's uh, really wonderful, and I found it also uh, quite romantic. Your uh, your story, of course. Um, what kind of uh, relationship are you thinking about? Is it love, or is it a, a guide? Is it more like uh, because I understand that when, it's, when you discover it's out, you are lost. But in which sense? Like, did you lose uh, something very dear or something more spiritual? What, what is it? Um, I could just say that when I told my wife about this, she said, this is a tragic love story. <laughs> and, uh, so she knows that she's been sharing me with something else for a while. No, um, I, th I think the... Um, that relationship is, you said a very good word, and that is a guide. I mean, I think for a long time it's, it's knowing there's something on your radar that if you're not sure about something, you can turn to it. It's not that I was watching exactly where Sumandila is. You know, I actually designed a robot that was following Sumandila for a while, which was, and sending Morse code signals. Um, so there was a consciousness of what, what the direction might be. But it was more about knowing that there's a relationship with the, um, with the, with, with the potential of what the, uh, the, what, what's being seen, both into space and down onto Earth. And so a lot of my drawing sessions when I'm in the studio, or when I'm doing performances or, or collaborative works, have, were about um, allowing an open-endedness to the process because I believe that we don't see, or, well, I wasn't seeing what Sumodila is seeing, so I was no longer getting the images, so I had to use 100% my imagination, my intuition to produce, which is probably natural for many artists to stand in front of the canvas and go crazy and produce something, but for me, that was a guide for a long time, to say that there was another camera, an extension of me, actually, that was blind, and because it was blind, I had to overcompensate by allowing my inner eye to produce things. So what I'm, why I'm saying maybe at the moment I'm a bit lost is because I'm, I need to acknowledge that actually it was always in me and she's still around. I completely know that. It's just a, a bit of a shock <laughs> when that happens, and especially because I wanted to show you Sumbadila tonight, and I wanted to point out and say, look, she's crossing over her Europe at the moment because she was supposed to be. <laughs> And so, and so for me, there is that, uh, that romantic um, um, and tragic relationship. But it also needs to be said that um, it is a wake-up call, because I think the wake-up call is, especially with a piece of art currently floating on the ISS and an artwork going to the moon, it is always the, the question of relevance. All of my work has always been about what relevance has the work got in the world today. And, and as I said, I spent so much time thinking about one, di one dimension and looking down onto Earth and trying to deal with that, I forgot about the satellite that was actually the reason for me to look down. And vice versa, I'm, I'm then, uh, now I'm thinking about this letter that's floating in space and that it's going to be returned to sender because <laughs> there's no recipient. And I think that's a really good thing for me to come back down to Earth. So the relationship is a good one that continues. Yeah. Uh, pardon. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I'm much more um, taking in the concentration the joy part actually it was a very joyful approach and uh, thank you um, I, I want to know much more about this hope uh, and looking up and maybe uh, it is much more um, uh, in your senses now because you forgot to look up and you were too much looking down then again remember to look up and uh, in this extension of saying uh, and in your way of finding hope in looking up is it about our um, ability to expand or is it about I want to know more about it actually that's, that's one of the discussions I had a lot with scientists. What is it that looking back in time, because that's really what we're doing with archaeologists sweeping away the ground, looking back and trying to make sense of things and, and looking to the stars, is a lot about trying to understand where we are now and how we can improve now. So there's this, this juxtaposition between looking back in time and developing for the future um, that the scientists acknowledge is an important part of their practice, at least those that I spoke to in the, in, in, at this uh, observatory and the ones um, linked to the satellite. Um, and so the, the sense of hope for me comes in knowing that I need to deal with the crisis um, in whichever way. So in Sutherland, for example, dealing with, a, with, with, with uh, very 
disempowered youth that were really struggling and, and trying to build something but couldn't or lost hope. I mean, we had a lot of very bizarre stories happen in those eight years. And on the one hand, it was such heavy work being engaged 100% in the community. I didn't call myself an artist to begin with. We just arrived doing projects. No one knew where I was from or what I was doing, and nor did I. It was, it was my holiday, actually. We spent a month of holiday in Sutherland to try and make sense of the world and then kept coming back because we realized it wasn't about making sense of space, but making sense of what was happening on the ground. And I think that ability to bounce between these different planes is what that that hope is for me. You know, the fact that we can dream of something else, it's not necessarily the expansion into somewhere else, but just the ability to dream really it became for me very evident in that space, a space of hope. And, and um, I think it sounds very simplistic to say to have an ability to dream when you're hungry and, and or when you're in a war. Uh, you know, so it's a very complex reality check that we constantly have. But I think as artists, we, we almost have this responsibility to have a reality check and bounce between the two and not just escape into our studios and become, that's my opinion, you know, not just be absorbed in our studios and make work for ourselves, but actually ask the question of how relevant we are and where it fits into society. And I felt that I could plug into a certain place where my um, aspirations, my hope, um, actually came from recognizing that others were seeing the work that I was producing in whether it's two-dimensional, just a performance, or, or actually an, an activity, um, was a form of them tapping into that moment of hope that I would have if I'm busy working in a studio creating something new. So that's a, it's a bit of an abstract answer, but I think it gives you a sense that it's, it's a very personal journey. Um, as for the um, piece of art that's now floating in the ISS, I think that's a completely different sense of hope. And I, I was involved in another project that's also part of the Moon Gallery where I got a group of participants to, to co-curate something, collaborate on something. And, um, and part of that group was, was some youngsters that were really troubled in terms of not having any aspirations and places to go. And we had these workshops and we developed ideas and we created something together and created a story. And I, I've got this whole series of WhatsApp messages on my phone of when I sent them the message that their piece is now in space and you know, that we watched the launch together and it was a, this great, creative thing. And they responded about, and the one literally said, this, they say the sky is the limit, but my dear is floating in space. And so I think that that idea that you can actually do something that you thought was impossible, even if it's this small and it's completely just no one's going to see it, but <laughs> space junk one day is going to, someone's going to come and clean it up and say, oh, there's so much space junk here and the little artwork is going to be there. Um, that moment for this youngster is probably the thing that they'll remember as being something to take forward. So I think they, that, that again is that notion of hope, which is very direct, which, which, which is empowering. And it happened, all of this happened during COVID. And you know, these last two years, this, this project developed. And in these last two years, um, to be in, in that interface with people that are disconnected with the world because they're stuck in their little home or in their shack or whatever it is, via this little concept that their work could go into space meant that they weren't worried about the front door and the public space and the, and the COVID that was outside, but it was a complete twist of the mind to go somewhere else. And, and again, it's about the perspective. It's about looking in different directions. Very long answer, I'm sorry. No, I'm, I'm a, no, because I have other questions, but it's a somehow building on this. Um, w with um, the telescope, I mean, simple telescope built uh, next to the salt, I was thinking about Patricio Guzman, uh, who is this uh, Chilean uh, filmmaker, and we did this uh, film, which is in, in, in Spanish, is Nostalgia de la, de la Luz and the Nostalgia of of light, of light, I suppose, in English. And it's about uh, the, the people that Pinochet was uh, dropping or uh, being in prison in the Atacama Desert. And there were some, some, some um, uh, astronomers that built this kind of grid to, to, to understand the sky, and this helped the people to survive in this uh, extremely harsh environment. And I was thinking uh, uh, space art as, I mean, in your case, as, as a healing process. Uh, c could you, d is it relevant to, to say that or is it too much? No, it's, it's, it's very much, it's completely relevant. Um, and I think we, 
I was talking a lot now about communities and participation and everything. I think we need to acknowledge that the healing and the process is also a selfish one. Um, it's me that needs healing. It's me that needs perspective. It's me that has questions around my pr privilege as a white South African speaking German in South Africa. You know, I mean, there are so many strange things that identity politics and histories and layers of complexity that that I needed healing with. And to find an instrument that could communicate with me was a, quite an important thing. Um, and so I think using instruments and machines and technologies to to tackle one's personal journey is one that a scientist doesn't necessarily do. I'm, I'm putting words, I would say yes and no, but in my conversations with one or two particular scientists, first and foremost there's this, this direct relationship with getting the information out of the machine in order to establish the next step. It is about a da data collection, it's about a process of understanding, it's about, uh, it's, it's about world making in a different way, sense making in a different way. But, um, but what I notice that if you take the science out of the machine, this machine becomes an incredibly personalized um, therapist. And, and I think that's what the healing part is, is that we form relationships with our machines. I'm not thinking of our phones. You know, we can, yes, we form relationships with our phones, but there's something else if that piece of technology was not meant for you, but actually allows you to speculate what it could mean for someone else. That becomes that healing process. So yes, the, that sense of therapy is definitely part of, um, and self-therapy is part of it. It's a cathartic relationship that you keep on having. Yeah. Is there any last question? You will be able to talk with Marcus at the break anyway. Okay, thank you, Marcus. We thank know you, that we could have gone for forever. Um, um, I would like to say that in September, at the end of September, Marcus and I are co-organizing an event uh, that will normally take place here. It's called Global Periphery and it's about space, art, and science from the perspective of a non-Western um, approach and, and people. So when, when we know more, <laughs> we tell you more.